Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, I, want to, I want to thank uh, Mitocon for inviting me. I just wanted to present the state of the uh, of the research for uh, for Adebenan. Okay. Right. Uh, the first thing is I'm an employee of a pharmaceutical uh, company, which means that obviously I have I cannot disclose uh, much information in terms of efficacy. I'll be presenting about development uh, as well as the current and future uh, research. I will not provide specific results. Uh, that I leave that to the uh, to the medical experts, to the LHO and expert physicians to to answer. Um, and then, in terms of um, yeah, disclaimer of adverse events, secondary effects. Here is the address where you should uh, notify any available or any uh, detected adverse event. Now, um, the, the previous speaker, which I thank her very much, has talked about the disease, the general uh, pro, um, aspects of the disease. And I just wanted to highlight that uh, obviously here the problem is the mitochondria. The mitochondria, we could, we could see it as a power generating um, station giving you know, power mainly to the, to, the, to the cell. And in the case of the optic nerve, this is uh, especially critical as uh, if this fails, obviously the visual function will be affected. And this is what we uh, finally we will see uh, in, this, uh, in this disease. As I said, it's a mitochondrial pathology, and the, let's say to make things simple for the for the non um, non scientific audience, I mean this would be like having a structural problem that impairs the normal functioning of, of a structure. Um, in the case of the therapeutic approach, um, let's say there are two major therapeutic approaches that we can try. Uh, one would be the one that um, the company used, Idevenon, which basically would simulate uh, like you know, you have a problem in a bridge, you take a ferry boat and you just shuttle, you know, people and goods uh, up and down. Um, and this is, this is what I'm going to be focusing in. The other approach, of course, is what we've been presented by the previous speaker, which is the, uh, the gene therapy, which obviously aims to um, address the, the specific structural problem by replacing the, uh, the, the, the structure that is not uh, working properly within the mitochondria. That is technically complex, as she mentioned. Uh, the other um, drawback of this is that it's very specific to uh, a mutation. So not, not the same uh, piece will, will work for all, the, uh, for all the bridges. While in the case of the uh, Idevenon, it's, it's, let's say it's not limited to, uh, to a specific mutation. Now, um, at this state of, uh, of, uh, of things, when the, when the drug was approved by IMA back in 2015, and there is already a normal uh, routine or real world use, uh, the, 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 the treatment, the management and the, the treatment management of the disease has been uh, beautifully presented by, by some of the experts already here in the, in the session uh, through an international consensus. So basically everything about the treatment is there. Um, what I'm gonna present now is what or how we contributed to the uh, to the knowledge and to the um, to the statements and the consensus that was that was reached. Uh, first of all, this is a rare disease, and I think that you've seen in the previous uh, with the previous uh, presentation that obviously the numbers of of, of patients in this uh, disease is very low. Another thing is that once the drug is available or approved, the use of placebo becomes really really difficult. Uh, literally impossible, so no more studies with placebo. And the other uh, problem general to uh, rare diseases is that um, many aspects are still unknown. Um, so that makes difficult to really uh, program or prepare the proper uh, studies. Now, uh, and this happened to us as well. So in the, the research, uh, the clinical research path of this, of this treatment, we started like everybody starts with a proper clinical trial, the first ever randomized double-blind uh, placebo-controlled clinical trial in, um, in LHON. And uh, we're talking back 2007. Uh, obviously the number of patients, as you can see, is quite limited. Uh, that produced some results, but I'll, I'll, I'll discuss the findings uh, later. But obviously, as we can see, uh, and we've seen already in the previous uh, presentation, uh, you don't know everything because you cannot, you cannot control everything, you don't have all the natural history. And in our case, we didn't have, let's say, proper natural history. So we had to research that, we did it, and we also got our natural history. 
Uh, I've talked about present and I mentioned this expanded access program and I say present because it has been just recently published in the Journal of Neuro Ophthalmology. Uh, so all the data is, is gonna be there uh, and you can, you can look at it like that. I will just give you some highlights of it. Regarding the, uh, the future, the future is, uh, the story is not over because this is a, an orphan drug, this is a rare disease. So obviously the authorities uh, want you know, to keep gathering information and evidence as we go. So there is an ongoing clinical trial, not yet finished, uh, which is gonna produce uh, other pieces of information that, uh, that the, the, the prescribers, that the users, that the patients, that the community needs. And then obviously, as, as I said, uh, another, another um, long-term study is safety. So with all we will have collected probably around uh, data from 1,000 patients, more or less, give or take, 1,000 uh, patients uh, worldwide along these years. Now, the first uh, step, as I said, was a clinical trial, that is Rhodes. It was published uh, back in 2011, you see on the, on the top left there, uh, the, the paper um, presented the results of the study, which were not positive, and uh, I'm not gonna elaborate much on that, I'm just gonna give you the learnings. But it's interesting that at the same time, um, the group of Professor Carelli presented their own, um, their own um, experience uh, outside this, this clinical trial. And that served a lot because provided additional evidence and also very, very important information. In this case, uh, what I'm gonna highlight here is uh, the learnings. The learnings from, from uh, Rhodes, first of all, is that what one thing that is logical to measure and, and measure in a, in a certain period of time might not uh, result uh, being the proper or the correct thing to do properly, uh, probably. So the first thing that I wanted to highlight, and this is also thanks to the um, Professor Carelli's publication, is the concept of clinically relevant change. So not all changes are equally good because there could be some variation in the same patient or interpatient or with the method. So the concept of clinically relevant change as a minimum change to be considered as efficacy, that is very important. And that has been used for the rest of our development. Another important thing was uh, the duration of the treatment of six months of the trial uh, was considered short at that time. But now, after that, we, we confirmed that it was really, really short, that probably if it, if it had been longer, we would have seen other results, more interesting or more positive. We don't know, obviously. In terms of the population, patients less than five years since onset, uh, so five years of, of duration of the disease at the moment of start treatment, that seems to be a, a suitable population. They could respond, uh, some better than other, but uh, that, that marks an interesting population to, uh, to focus in, the, in terms of potential efficacy. And then another interesting concept is that, although we would all like to prevent the disease, um, I mean, prevention proves to be difficult, but not impossible. So you can still see that some patients, uh, in some patients, the treatment prevented further deterioration below a certain limit of visual acuity. And that obviously for the, for the patient is really, really relevant. So with all this information, what we were missing here is um, how does an untreated population behave? And obviously there, there have been many populations out there. Um, Dr. Tayel mentioned a few of them, uh, but, but we decided to go our own way. We did, uh, we did our own, uh, the company did our own um, natural history. And these are the results of we got. So these are all untreated patients. And we're talking about uh, 380 bit cases here. So the first thing we saw in this untreated population from all around the world is that uh, Untreated patients deteriorate pretty quickly. That has been published, but this confirms the results. So in barely six months, everything goes really, really severe. Uh, additionally, this deterioration is severe. So it's not just a, a, a slight deterioration. You, you really go into severe vision, visual impairment and many patients go actually off chart. And the third and very important is that the spontaneous recovery is rare. Rare, but not impossible. The problem is how rare it is. And what we can see here is that overall, looking at the three main mutations, we would be talking about 31% of the spontaneous recovery, considering the concept that I used before of, uh, 
of um, clinically relevant recovery. Uh, and that is seen also in the three mutations, as you can see on the screen. Now, um, with that, let's say that we are better prepared to ask questions to, uh, to the, the, the next step, which is this expanded access program that has been just published, uh, as I said, a couple of weeks ago. So the questions that we had after Rhodes, after the clinical, uh, the clinical uh, record survey, the natural history that I've just mentioned, is uh, what happens if patients are on treatment and then you stop treatment quickly? Uh, you stop treatment too soon. Uh, could there be a, a lack of efficacy? Uh, in other words, if you maintain the treatment, you can see that the efficacy improves. We saw that in some patients, uh, maintaining the treatment uh, actually resulted in late response. Uh, so with that, one could be prepared to answer whether there is a, a minimum recommended duration, which uh, in our case, we saw that it could be around 18 to 24 months before you actually uh, consider a failure or a success in the treatment. Uh, another interesting and very important finding is that even patients after starting therapy can deteriorate a little bit. The visual acuity can deteriorate and that it would be an adhere on treatment. That shouldn't in, uh, induce the, the, the physician or the patient to stop the drug because we've seen that in some patients maintaining the treatment actually recovers vision. Another important thing is the, the degree of uh, visual acuity, whether you know you have to be uh, slightly uh, affected or more severely affected in order to respond more or less. We don't see difference. Uh, both uh, slightly affected patients and severely affected patients have the chance to respond, those that responded. And then another important finding is that once you see efficacy, once you confirm the efficacy, uh, that is not it yet, because if you maintain treatment, some patients can still uh, uh, show an improvement, an additional improvement of the visual acuity. So all the details are in that, in that publication. In terms of uh, the future, so what are we doing now, as I said, is, is the LEROS. LEROS is an ongoing clinical trial. Enrollment is closed. Uh, we, we reached the number of, of patients, is completed, but it's gonna answer uh, pending questions which are extremely important for the, for the proper management and use of the drug. One of them is Rhodes was very good and it had very good things, but it was, uh, let's say, too short, just 24 weeks. So here, uh, patients are going to be treated for 24 months, and that will allow us to know what happens in the long term. The second, the second let's say, uh, objective or interesting point that we will, we will try to find out is what we've seen in the EAP, which is not controlled, I mean, there is no control group, there is no natural history controlling that. Uh, is that what you will really see? So Rhodos, having a natural history match, statistically match control group, will allow us to uh, really profile or confirm uh, the results of the EAP. The, the other thing is going to be the... Um, one of the problems of the EAP is that patients were not all of them followed for five years. There were patients followed for five years, but many patients were followed for much less. So, I mean, the duration of the follow-up was variable, which means that uh, uh, Leros having a, a, a controlled, established follow-up of two years will answer this question. And uh, finally, the fact that it has a properly matched uh, natural history group will obviously provide something to compare us uh, my previous, uh, the previous speaker has, uh, has um, already advanced in their therapy. Now, uh, the last bit of research being done, let's say, by, by the company is, uh, is the PAROS, which is, this is a post-authorization safety study, something very normal, very common, very usual in the, uh, in the orphan drugs. The authorities and everybody is interested in keeping an eye, an active eye on the pharmacovigilance. So this is just a long term. Um, the, uh, the enrollment has, has completed. This is in patients taking the drug uh, on a routine basis. I mean, prescribed by the physician. The difference is that the data is collected and the data is periodically sent to the authorities. So here we are, as I said, actively supervising safety. Now, but still, once we finish that, let's say late in 2021, um, the drug is in the market, fine, we will find more information, but there are still questions. And these questions that will need to be answered in the future are, can patients relapse? 
a patient that has shown efficacy, it doesn't matter with, with which um, uh, therapy, can still show a relapse of the disease. What about the patients longer with the disease longer than five years? Can they still uh, respond? And the other one is the, the, the $1 million question. Can you prevent patients from, uh, from developing the disease? And finally, uh, once the, the, the therapies are on the market, I mean, what about combination therapy, be it sequential or simultaneous? So with that, I just want to thank uh, everyone. I want to thank the patients, the relatives, the investigators. I want to thank Mitocon and the audience for um, listening. Thank you very much.